Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about a problem that... Wait, what? My camera? Uh, okay. I think I know what's going on. Let me rearrange that really quickly. I think... Yeah, okay, that looks good now. So this problem basically single-handedly made me a grandmaster. Without this, my rank wouldn't have been nearly good enough, but solving this put me in 54th, and it gave me a massive rating boost. And if you're able to solve this problem within a contest, you would have a very easy time getting to red. Do you think you're up to the challenge? So in this video, I'll describe what the problem asks, and then give my story on what happened throughout the contest, and with this problem specifically, because it was a very weird but also kind of exciting experience overall. And then I'll describe the actual solution to it. Now let's jump right into the problem. So this problem is called Rearrange. Its link is in the description. I think it's rather beautiful because it doesn't really require much background to understand like what it, what it asks you to do or its solution. The difficulty mostly comes solely from coming up with a strategy. So for clarity, the problem asks you to write a program that solves this. You are given a matrix, which is a 2D grid of numbers. It has R rows and C columns, so there are R times C numbers total. You're also guaranteed that all the numbers are different as well. So you're able to, with this matrix, you can shuffle or rearrange the numbers in the matrix however you want. You want to create a new matrix that satisfies some specific properties. Now these properties are kind of weird, but this adds to the difficulty of the problem. You first have to sort of intuitively understand what you're really trying to do, and then once you get that down, then you also have to actually do it. So here's what you have to do. Let's look at the, each of the rows individually, and we're going to look at their maximum element. Let's like write it to the side or something. We're going to sort this list of maximum elements, and this sorted list of row maximums must be the same between the old matrix and the matrix you generate. We'll do the same for the columns, and the sorted list of column maximums must also be the same between your matrix and the input matrix. But that can't be the whole problem, obviously, because then you could just the output would just be the original matrix. So there's another condition. Each row and column in the new matrix must be bitonic. Now what is bitonic? It essentially means it behaves like a mountain. It goes up, and then it goes down. If it only goes up, or it only goes down, that's also fine. But there can't be a moment where it's going down, and then also going up. That is invalid for bitonicity. So it must be bitonic, and every row and every column must be bitonic if you consider them like individually. Your output will be this rearranged matrix that satisfies these properties. So for this specific input, something like this matrix would work. The list of row maximums is the same as for columns, and everything is bitonic. And by the way, the reason I'm sorting the list of row and column maximums is to demonstrate that order doesn't matter. Really, you just need the same set of row and column maximums. It doesn't matter what order they're in, as long as you have the same numbers. So that's the problem. Have fun with it. Now this is my story about the contest. And after all, this was the time I got red, right? It must have been exciting. And yeah, it really was. So first of all, this contest was really weird. Normally, the problems are supposed to be roughly ordered by difficulty, so that the later letters are harder. For example, B is harder than A. Now, here's a normal solve distribution at the end of the contest. The person, I the person icons to the right say how many people solved it. Here's the solve distribution for the contest I'm talking about. A total mess, right? C is basically as hard as F, E is easier than D, which is much easier than C, and just all of the last four in general have very few solves. Looking at the scoreboard, there are a few people with A, B, and one more problem. There are a few people with multiple of those, but the vast majority have only A and B. For myself, I solved A, B, and D, which is the problem I described beforehand. And it was pretty quickly, and that speed was my advantage. It gave me quite a good rank. So how did this end up happening? I solved A and B with a pretty good time, enough to bring me back to International Master, which is another rank, even without the solve on D. A and B weren't that significant, so I'll just ignore them. So after that, I looked at the dashboard for what problem to solve next. And this is what I saw in it. And this is what the scoreboard looked like. A single solve on D by Tourist, the undisputed best at this time. Nothing else. This was it for around 8 minutes, until, a, until another solution went into D by KSUM48. Nothing on C, which already showed this contest was unusual. A few more solves slowly trickled in. Let's jump to an hour. Only 15 people had solved anything other than A or B. Not a single solve on C. D and E had the most solves, relatively. So for me, they seemed like the best to look at and try and solve for myself. But speaking of myself, seeing all this happen, seeing how few solves these problems had, I'd already sort of mentally given up on all of these already. I mean, 
they looked hard. I read them. They looked really hard. But I still tried to make somewhat of an effort on, effort on the off chance that I actually did get one. So I glanced at C, didn't really take it in that much, and I fully read D and E. While E had more solves, both by then and by the end of the contest, it was combinatorics, which has always been one of my weakest topics. So most of my attention went to D. But again, I'd kind of given up. You know, I didn't expect much. So I, I, like, I went downstairs, I talked to my parents, I sort of just relaxed a bit, things you don't normally do in the middle of a contest. But the problem was still running in the back of my mind then. I was sort of running my standard problem solving process, but it was passively, just in the background instead of actively. And a while passed, nothing, no ideas. I looked at the dashboard again, still only a few solves and everything. Another wall passed, no new ideas. But suddenly, at some point, out of nowhere, the idea hit me like a truck, like a baby truck, because it had just formed in my mind, but it was still a truck. It really was like a eureka moment, if you've heard of those. A few other problems had given me a similar reaction, but none to this degree, because I knew this was by far the hardest problem I had taken on yet, especially in a contest. So I, I jumped up, woo, and I probably scared the hell out of my parents, which is fun. I ran over to my computer and just started like typing furiously, fleshing out my idea before it slipped away from me. So I'll skip the boring details about the code. It worked, almost flawlessly, at least on the samples. So I submitted the solution. There were three samples, so pretest four was the first hidden test. And the, the way the judging happened sort of scared me a bit, because I refreshed once and I saw that it was running on exactly pretest 4. So why was it stopped there? Was it wrong? Did it hit the time limit? There was a sort of mini panic that went through my head. But soon after I refreshed again and all of those concerns were immediately cleared. I saw those glorious two green words, pretests passed. Now I was sort of in disbelief from here. I had never had such a good rank before like this late into a contest. And my solving of that problem in general just kind of didn't feel real. But it was. I shot up to 33rd from that. And this is, where it, this is where the interesting part sort of ended. I tried E in the same way that I tried D, but I never got any sort of ideas on it. So most of my time was just spent watching the scoreboard excitedly as I slowly dropped over time to 54th, and that was my final rank. In the end, system tests ran smoothly. I got my plus 49, 149. I got my red. Everything just worked out. It really was like basically the perfect contest. Very rarely do I solve everything smoothly with no penalty, but it worked out this time. I've never had another performance as good at this, as good as this, at least at the time of making this video, hopefully in the future. So really, just perfect. An amazing contest to give me red for the first time, and I have managed to keep it since. So that's my story. Now, were you able to solve this problem yourself? If you're interested in the solution, here it is. There are probably other solutions that are different from this one, and you can test yours by submitting your program to the problem that I put in the description. But this is my solution. Since we can rearrange how we want, we can basically construct the new matrix element by element. The initial order just totally doesn't matter. So imagine the new matrix is an empty grid, and we're going to put numbers in from largest to smallest. Now notation-wise, let's call an element dominant if it's the maximum in either its row or column. So it's dominant if it, if it shows up in the list of row maxims or column maxims. It doesn't matter which. And some can even dominate both its row and its column. So let's just focus on the dominant elements. We'll fill in the rest later. We want the row and column maximums to be the same. And this is my construction for it. Let's look at the largest element, 12. Of course, the largest element has to be dominant over both its row and its column. So let's put in the top left. Now we look at 11. It's dominant over its column, but not its row. So let's put it in a place where it's in the same row as a larger element, but it has a column to itself. Now I'll just say, why not right to the right of the 12? Now 10. It's dominant over both its row and its column, so it should have those to itself, because it should not be in the same place as the larger elements or it will be dominated. Let's put it at the position of the 11, but right and down one. 9 dominates over nothing. We ignore it for now. 8 dominates its row, but not its column. So we'll put it at the 10, but 1 down, so it has a row to itself, but not a column. 7 dominates nothing, we ignore it. 6 dominates its column, so let's put it to the right of 8. And now all the dominant elements are now down. So you get the idea? The dominant elements are going to trace a path from the top left to the bottom right. If something dominates a column, we move our current position to the right. If it dominates a row, we move down. If it dominates both, we move in both directions. We'll maintain the position of the previous dominant element 
and adjust the new position accordingly based on what is dominated. And that's, this construction is why I love this problem. It's such a simple idea, like tracing out a path, and it's clear that it should work because every element that's dominant like, gets freedom to dominate what it needs to. But it's so hard to come up with because there are so many different possibilities for solutions. The fact, the possibility that you stumble upon this one is very low. Now, there's a bit more to the solution. What do we do with the elements that we don't dominate? But really, we just need to put them in a place where they don't dominate. So we need to put them next to larger elements in a way that keeps everything by tonic. So we'll just put them adjacent to the elements that we already placed. And we have to also give the constraint that they have to be adjacent both horizontally and vertically. Otherwise, it will break the bitonic, bitonicity. So this works because we're going from small to large. So when we're putting an element down that's not dominant, we're putting it at the end of its row and its column. Like it's going to be either to the left of all the elements that are down already, or to the right, and it'll be above or below everything. So it means that it's not going to break the bitonicity because it's smaller than everything else and it's being placed at the end. So with this construction, everything works out, basically. And finding the positions for the non-dominant elements is much like a breadth-first search, where we're going to maintain candidate positions in a queue, the positions that are adjacent on both horizontally and vertically, and we update their neighbors as we visit them. Now, there is a bit more work involved in formally proving that you won't run out of space to put the non-dominant elements in. I'm not going to flesh it out here, but feel free to check out the official solution in the description, as I believe they do and should prove it there. I'll also put my code in the description if you're interested in how this specific solution works. So yeah, I personally found this problem beautiful, and I think it's relatively easy to understand compared to most of the problems of its difficulty. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I hope the story about the contest was interesting. If this video works out well, I'll try more videos of this kind of format because I kind of like doing this sort of thing. So there's also that site that I used within the video to look at, the score, to look at what the scoreboard looked like mid-contest. That will be in the description as well. Feel free to use it, although there are some extra UX user experience changes that I think it's lacking, like for example, error reporting. If it crashes, it's just not going to tell you, and that's just because of laziness. Um, but. For this video, that's all, so goodbye.